This video is sponsored by Nebula. Stick until the end of the video to see a preview of my Nebula exclusive content, Animate Court. In 2022, with the Depp v. Heard case becoming a goldmine for content creators, we saw domestic violence put into mainstream discussion on a level that hasn't been seen since probably Chris Brown and Rihanna. The level of fame and elements of nostalgia surrounding Depp made this public split difficult from the very beginning. Then, as the true crime bubble exploded online, especially following the murder of Gabby Patea the year before, a surge of people with no qualifications and no experience on domestic violence felt comfortable deciding that they knew the truth while having no understanding of the evidence, the history, or anything leading up to what creates domestic violence situations. But it also highlighted the misinformation and lack of understanding about domestic and interpartner violence, especially around the term mutual abuse. I eventually want to do a more in-depth video about domestic violence and pop culture, especially in the ways in which it has led to many myths surrounding DV. But I honestly need to be in a better situation before I can deal with that level of content. So this is me attempting to tackle that subject in a much more narrow lens with a surprisingly perfect example that I found on South Park. Last year, I ended up just putting on South Park. I'm a millennial, I grew up with South Park. I know all the things about it. Here are video essays about why there are problematic elements of it, as well as other content creators who do really good video essays on South Park, including Kitty Monk, who I really love, and Johnny Two Cellos. But the seasons 20 and 21 of South Park were interesting. There were member berries. There was Garrison as Trump. There was Kyle's dad becoming the living embodiment of my nightmares. Hey, I'd like to volunteer to kick you in the vagina. Where do I sign up? But the member berry stuff was pretty funny. I did say, member chan-chans. <laughs> a, a lot, a lot that summer. Member? Hey, hey, member Ghostbusters? <gasps> Within those seasons, Eric Cartman ends up dating Heidi Turner, and their relationship is horrible. And not just in the typical horrible South Park relationship way where you have a really inconsiderate blowhard partner and one trying to be sane but also kind of blowhard partner. It was very specifically horrible in the way that Cartman's manipulative elements totally destroyed Heidi from the inside out until she became Cartman 2.0. As I was watching the show, especially in 2023, I couldn't help but notice a specific way in which their relationship was almost the perfect example of what not just an abusive relationship looks like, but concepts like Darvo, gaslighting, and reactionary abuse. Domestic and interpartner violence has a very mixed history on television. While shows take it seriously for the sake of drama, they often put in twists and other embellishments that end up reducing a more complex issue into Law and Order SVU Greatest Hits version. I hope you're happy. Oh, let's go. I lost a husband. My son lost his father. Paula, you deserve better than that. So does your son. What the hell do you know about it? I was happy. I was fine. Leading to misinformation, but also a very narrow idea of what a quote unquote real victim looks like. So today, it's time to buckle in and do a good old-fashioned textual analysis of Eric and Heidi on South Park and what it reveals to us about what we don't know and what we think we know about abuse. Hey, wait up, babe! Part 1, The Terms In order to make sure we're on the same page, we need to define some terms clearly. All sources will be listed at the bottom of the video and will appear somewhere on screen as well. I know there is a lot of misinformation out there, and since I am not an expert, I want to make sure that the experts and other reputable organizations are being cited so that I'm not continuing to spread misinformation. So let's start with number one. Domestic or interpartner violence is a pattern of behaviors used by one partner to maintain power and control over another partner in an intimate relationship. I think this definition is key because it highlights the fact that it isn't just about hitting or screaming. It's about wanting to maintain power and control over another person. The form that it takes can vary since we know any person of any background can be abusive. The National Domestic Violence Hotline lists these as some of the signs of potential abuse. Telling you you never do anything right. Showing extreme jealousy of your friends or time spent away from them. Preventing or discouraging you from spending time with others, particularly friends, family members, or peers. 
insulting, demeaning, or shaming you, especially in front of other people, preventing you from making your own decisions, including about working or attending school, controlling finances in the household without discussion, such as taking your money or refusing to provide money for necessary expenses, pressuring you to have sex or perform sexual acts you're not comfortable with, pressuring you to use drugs or alcohol, intimidating you through threatening looks or actions, insulting your parenting, or threatening to harm or take your children or pets away, intimidating you with weapons like guns, knives, bats, or mace, destroying your belongings or your home. Not only are these things meant to isolate someone, but they do immense damage to their self-esteem. It starts to erode a person on multiple levels, and that can sometimes lead to reactionary abuse. Despite how the term sounds, reactionary abuse is a tactic. For example, if a partner slaps you and you in response to that slap them back, that response is framed by abusers as now you are both equally abusive. It is self-defense weaponized against the victim. According to the National Legal Service, abusers tend to see reactive abuse as a get out of jail free card. It acts as a form of justification for the behaviors that they exhibit towards another person. They know that they are abusive, but they use a person's reactions as a valid reason for those behaviors. In many cases, an abuser will exaggerate the extent of the victim's reaction, minimizing their own behaviors to make them appear victimized. The real value in reactive abuse for abusers comes in the fact that it can prevent many victims from coming forward, speaking up, and asking for help. Victims begin to believe that they are in fact to blame. This can make them scared to seek help fearing authorities will believe their abusers and create consequences for the victim. Over time, victims begin to feel more and more trapped in a relationship. They feel they cannot leave and may start to form trauma bonds with their abusers. To me, this always reminds me of how when two kids fight at school and even though one person threw the punch, both kids get in trouble for the fight. Everyone knows this is kind of bullshit, but to perpetuate the idea that violence isn't the answer, both kids get in trouble, even though words were not going to stop that one person from throwing the punch and the person who threw the punch or started the antagonism probably should get a more severe punishment. That shifting of responsibility connects to DARVO. DARVO stands for Deny, Attack, Reverse Victim and Offender. Abusers will use this tactic, especially if there has been an incident of reactionary abuse, to not only shift blame, but also deny anything ever happened. It also uses things like therapy speak to continue to manipulate. According to Heather Kent speaking on DomesticShelters.org, a therapist is not necessarily able to see what's happening and can cause further damage and enable the abuse to continue. Darvo is appealing to abusers because it allows them to protect a false sense of self. If they see themselves as a good person, this is a good way to protect that. And because the average person, even a therapist not trained on this issue, can fall for manipulative tactics, it ends up being especially difficult for survivors to not just leave, but to know that they need to leave, especially when they've been isolated. So then where in that does it leave terms like mutual abuse? Mutual abuse is described as, quote, when both partners are equally abusive to one another. However, many experts do not believe it exists. And if it does, it is very rare. Why? The Blackburn Center, an organization built around protecting victims of domestic violence, put out this statement following the Depp v. Heard trial to speak about this topic since it came up so often in the media. People who have devoted their careers to the field, such as Ruth Glenn, president and CEO of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, argues that in every incident between two people, there is always a primary aggressor. A person who defends themselves against this aggression may appear to be abusive, but it is not the same as the pattern of power and control that is the hallmark of domestic violence. Similarly, people in a relationship may engage in situational violence Without a pattern of abuse and control, however, situational violence is not considered domestic violence. This is the single most important factor in understanding why mutual abuse or reactive abuse is a myth. At its heart, domestic violence is about an imbalance of power and control. In an abusive relationship, both partners may exhibit unhealthy or toxic behaviors. However, one person tends to have more power and control over the other. The abuse isn't mutual when one person is reacting to the other's emotional, physical, financial, or other abuse. Having said that, 
you might be asking, then why do people think it exists? And I would say, in my opinion, people want it to exist. And as we will explore in this very case study, people do want to believe that there is a degree of personal responsibility when it comes to victims that you should have left or that you should have known better. Despite the empathy and the fact that we know it's very hard for survivors to escape, people still judge those who are caught up in those situations. To quote the amazing and talented Rain Fisher Kwan, one of the most frustrating aspects of the cultural response to this suit is the sheer volume of people now insisting that it's both radical and necessary to declare that women can lie. Women can do bad things. The idea that the dominant culture has moved forward enough for the systematic distrust of women to be anything other than a default setting is somewhere between bizarre fantasy and bold face manipulation. In reality, everyone still thinks women are lying all the time and they never stopped for a second. I call this idea ladies as pimps to equality. We're going to speed run through the rest of these terms because I know it can be a little dry. But again, I just want to have you knowing all this in the back of your head as we go through Cartman and Heidi's relationship. Trauma bonding. It's not just two people, quote unquote, bonding over shared trauma. It is an unhealthy bond that forms between a person living with abuse and their abuser. Where the adulation between trauma and abuse creates a bond and dependency between the victim and their abuser. Gaslighting. Emotional abuse where the intent is to make someone question their own feelings, instincts, and sanity. It is used to keep power and control over someone. It is not just lying. Love bombing. Manipulation where someone showers a person with excessive love, attention, praise, and affection to control or exploit them. Love bombing is not the same thing as new relationship energy where you're excited and hyper affectionate towards someone because it is coming from a place of genuine interest. It is not even dating and then ghosting. It is a way of making you dependent on someone else for validation and using that dependency as a way to control you, isolate you, and make it so that no one else can even reach out to you. All right. I feel like that's enough of a terminology preamble that we can now make our way to (sighs) the messy ballad of Cartman and Heidi. Women are funny, Heidi. Get over it. So I have with me a copy of uh, Salvation, Black People in Love by Bell Hooks in order to keep me grounded when I laugh a little too much about some of this shit because I am unfortunately a millennial. I do find some of South Park funny. I am not unproblematic. The story begins in episode one of season 20, Member Berries. Episode begins with all the girls in South Park sitting down during the national anthem to protest the harassment they receive online. Four athletes sitting out on the national anthem, three of them not even black. A shocker here in South Park. Thanks for joining us. They all think that Eric Cartman is the troll who is harassing them, which, you know, makes sense, tracks. Carmen, however, says he's a changed man who thinks women are funny and wears a token Lives Matter shirt. As a strategy of colonization, encouraging enslaved Blacks to embrace and uphold white supremacy aesthetics was a masterstroke. Teaching Black folks to hate dark skin was one way to ensure that whether white oppressors were present or not, values of white supremacy would still rule the day. Prominent patriarchal Black male leaders who resisted racism on every other front showed a preference for lighter-skinned women. By their actions, they made the color caste system acceptable. From slavery to the present day, dark-skinned children in Black families risk not being as highly valued as lighter counterparts. In my lifetime, the 60s Black Power movement was the only time that the color caste system was militantly challenged. It doesn't help that Cartman's genuine change feels like trolling. It is time for us all to realize and accept that girls are cool and women are funny. It ends up leading to a conflict between the boys and the girls, which Cartman agitates by drawing a vagina on his face. I didn't know vaginas had balls. Carmen thinks that a gender war is coming, but Kyle won't let it happen and is determined to stop Skank Hunt 42, the troll, who turns out to be Kyle's dad, Gerald. There's also a J.J. Abrams fixing the national anthem by rebooting it as exactly the same as it was before subplot. 
it's pretty funny because it's true. This introduces the member berries. They're not important to this element of the story, but they are pretty humorous and get referenced a lot on pop culture stuff. So you can Google it. But essentially the TLDR is that they are berries that just fill you with nostalgia and be like, remember Ghostbusters? <laughs> I'll just put a clip of it here. Remember Chewbacca again? Oh, I love to remember Chewbacca. <laughs> Episode 2, Skank Hunt 42. We find out that Skank Hunt 42, aka Gerald, is photoshopping penises into women's mouths and going around message boards just saying sexist, racist, and gross things. Heidi's mom gets one of these Photoshop pictures and Heidi decides to throw her phone off the bridge and give up social media as a result which everyone treats as an unaliving. Heidi Turner, she, she quit Twitter. The girls decide that the boys must be punished for this and it leads the boys to panic. You get blamed for the group you belong to, even if you didn't do nothing. God, Butters is an incel now and it makes me so sad because I used to love like, remember when Butters was like a nice pimp who like gave his, his bottom bitches like stars and sunshine? Like, was that a red flag the whole time? Do I not understand red flags? I just hold on to all the money because bitches can't be trusted with it. Clyde decides that they need to end it. By end it, they mean lure Cartman into a cabin and break all of his stuff so that he can't go online. I mean, it's thousands of dollars of stuff, so the screams are valid. I think this is what the one time I'm like, yeah, I would also be screaming like this. But then they realized Cartman didn't do it because ScanCut42 was still all over the internet. In response to the continued trolling, the girls end up deciding to pull a G-rated Lysistrata and break up with all of their boyfriends. Fuck. Episode three, The Damned. The gender war is here, but Eric and Heidi, both having no social media, end up bonding and going to the park. I know how hard it is when school gets out with no phone, no human contact. On the park bench, Heidi apologizes for thinking Carmen was a troll, and Carmen is revealed to have been earnest about his love for women's comedy. I guess I didn't deserve a second chance. I really tried to make changes. I really tried to become a better person. So when you held the assembly that women were just as funny as men, you, you weren't being sarcastic? Every time Amy Schumer talks about her vagina, I lose my fucking mind. Women who harden their hearts, who turn away from love, are unforgiving in their relationships with other females. It's, it's funny to see females written in a non-derogatory way like this. <laughs> this is as true of Black women as it is of any group of women in this society. In my book about writing, Remembered Rapture, I include an essay discussing the fact that Black women who write about my work have done so with a level of mean-spirited hatefulness that is awesomely intense. Audre Lorde was one of the first black female feminist thinkers to call to attention the rage and hostility black women unleash on one another. In her insightful essay, Eye to Eye, Lorde wrote, why do black women reserve a particular voice of fury and disappointment for each other? Who is it we must destroy when we attack each other? With the tone of predetermined and correct annihilation. This cruelty between us, this harshness, is a piece of the legacy of hate with which we were inoculated. Heidi tells Cartman she's sorry he lost all his friends, but she is his friend now. At the end of the episode, we see Heidi and Cartman bonding over just being with each other offline. Cartman asks, what is at the bottom of a vagina? I just don't understand what's at the bottom of a vagina. Do you want me to show you? Holy shit. This is the beginning of their relationship. Episode four, wieners out. Kyle wants to show the girls that they, the boys, respect them. But Butters isn't having any of it because Butters is an incel. You're all snakes in the grass. Every last one of you. Oh, Charlotte? He decides during the national anthem to protest the girls by dropping his pants and taking his wiener out because he is, quote, proud of his little wiener. Don't let anyone tell you you're somehow less because you're a boy. Kyle apologizes to Cartman and thinks Cartman is going to try and get back at him, but Cartman is a changed man again. Why? Because he's seen a vagina. I saw a vagina, Kyle. What? I'm not holding a grudge. I'm happier now. I have purpose. Carmen and Heidi are together and they are radiating new relationship energy in the worst way, like almost the way a polyamorous couple gets when they have a new member. It's so fucking irritating. Carmen keeps thinking of man's ability to terraform Mars 
for some reason as well. Since they're no longer on social media, they really just don't care about any of this stuff with the gender war. And well, if there ever was a great argument for getting off Twitter, it was definitely this. And again, correct. (laughs) We gave up social media and all the ugliness that goes along with it. And we're in a better place. Episode five, douche in a Danish. The gender war is escalating, but if there was one thing the whole school is united in, it is that Heidi and Cartman are weird together. They decide to do a school fundraiser in order to help with something in the A plot about the election. It doesn't matter. It just shows an escalation of their relationship. I think that somehow trolling is playing a bigger part in this than anyone even realizes. Episode 6, Fort Collins. Heidi has put up like a true crime board and is trying to figure out who the troll is. Cartman continues to be good, but when Kyle brings up Troll Trace and the fact that anyone will be able to use it to find out who's been trolling them, Cartman then remembers him saying that Ghostbusters sucked and quote, chicks ruined it. I'm gonna send Butters an email right now. Dude, don't bother with new Ghostbusters. Totally not funny. Chicks ruined it. Can we get ice cream now? I want to get the taste of ass out of my mouth. Nothing has damaged the spirit of loving, kindness, and tolerance in Black life more than the absolute embrace of patriarchal thinking. 60s Black militants not only self-righteously attacked homosexuals, they made homophobia a criterion for authentic Blackness. This was evidenced by Eldridge Cleaver's blatant attack on James Baldwin, whom he wanted to dethrone from his position as an authority and spokesperson for Black experience. In an essay on Baldwin's work, Cleaver called him a traitor, a puppet of the white power structure who was engaging in Quote, a despicable underground guerrilla war waged on paper against black masculinity. Writing about Cleaver's attacks on Baldwin in 13 Ways of Looking at a Black Man, Henry Louis Gates explains, What was different this time was a newly sexualized black nationalism that could stigmatize homosexuality as a capitulation to alien white norms and the corresponding accredited homophobia, a powerful means of policing the sexual arena as a progressive political act. It is not surprising that in this historical moment, more Black people than ever, especially the young, were turning their backs on the Christian church. The same macho men who attacked Baldwin by calling him Martin Luther Queen attacked King's message of love, tolerance, and forgiveness. Readers note, Martin Luther Queen? Fabulous. (laughs) Carbon then starts to relapse into past behavior and lies to Heidi, saying Jimmy wrote the emails. This is the first official red flag. And during the movie, I was like, wait, where's my phone? And I couldn't find it. And then Jimmy said, ha screw you, Carmen. And he was holding my phone and he ran off with it and said, I'm going to send a bunch of texts and emails from your phone so everyone thinks they're from you. Then when Heidi says that emoji analysis will be able to figure out who wrote everything, Carmen starts to freak out even more because he's a damn dirty liar. Episode 7, oh geez. Cartman then goes to Butters to try and get him to join in some convoluted plan that will allow him to keep lying to Heidi, but Butters stands up to Cartman by continuing to be an incel. Whatever happened to sticking with your kind? Sticking to my kind? You guys broke all my stuff! Because girls drove us to break all your stuff, dumbass! The election results make Heidi sad and retreat into herself because, yeah, President Garrison Trump is a nightmare. She looks to Carmen for validation and ends up supporting him. In order to cover up his own flaws, he just continues to manipulate her and takes her to... Do you really think there's hope? Yes. I do. So many things about this season aged so weirdly. Episode 8, Members Only. A lot of people are at space as because they want to leave the planet, including Butters, who has seen the light when it comes to his actions, mainly from a sense of self-preservation. I'm tired of girls saying boys need to change. Somebody has to stand up for our rights. Something's about to happen that you aren't aware of. So I realized at this point that maybe I should explain the troll trace, the troll storyline better. So essentially, Gerald has become a super troll and his actions have caused the unaliving of a notable woman in Denmark. And so the people of Denmark decide that they're going to create something called Troll Trace, which will allow them to trace the comments of every person's internet history. So all the trolls will be exposed. This, of course, uh, is not great. 
If you live in the city of Fort Collins, there is a chance that all your emails and your entire internet history has been made accessible to the public. And Gerald gets kidnapped and it also ties in with the election. Um, so yeah, it's all connected. But again, since this video is not about that, I didn't want to get into it with any real depth because I hate thinking about it. Butters ends up talking about women in comedy, which makes Cartman get controlling and possessive instantly. Butters, you expect people to believe that you went from being the biggest asshole in the school to a soft-hearted feminist like me. Well, I don't think there was ever any question women are funny. Remember that movie 9 to 5 with Lily Tomlin and Dolly Parton? Elon Musk shows up and takes them on a tour, but reveals that the technology for the rocket isn't done because they need a lot of smart people. And then Butters says, I'm not sure if you know our friend Heidi. She's really smart, and really funny. Episode nine, not funny. So now Heidi is figuring out Mars rocket stuff and Carbon is pissed that guys are calling Heidi smart because she's also funny too. Get over it, women can be funny. I don't mean to laugh, but it's just, it's just so, Carbon's so weird. Butters tells Cartman that girls are sick of boys shit and want to force them underground and milk them for semen. Stick us underground where we just get milked for our semen. Boy's only hope is to start over on Mars. Red Rocks! Yay, yay! Butters then puts the idea of Heidi being smart and funny as manipulation into Cartman's head, which starts to turn him into a paranoid douchebag. Heidi, because she is smart, figures out space travel, but Cartman gets really devastated that he realizes that she's not funny, guys. Okay, okay, now could you just do the my vagina thing for them? Could you just say my vagina? Episode 10, the end of serialization as we know it. The finale for season 20, Heidi has found out a way to get mankind to Mars, but now Butter's paranoia has come into Cartman's brain and he thinks that girls will be enslaving men on Mars for their semen and jokes. In the joke minds of Mars. No one speaks about the topic of Black people in love without addressing issues of low self-esteem and self-hatred. It is by now common knowledge that the trauma of white supremacy and ongoing racist assault leaves deep psychic wounds. Whether the issue is a painful color caste system in Black life or violent actions used by whites against Blacks, denigrating speech, physical aggression, or dehumanizing representation, every day all Black people encounter, as everyone does, some expression of hatred towards Blackness. In predominantly Black environments, someone may be casually using the word or joking about Black folks as lazy and not want to work. As the men work to undermine Heidi, she is confused as to why he's being so distant. They blow up SpaceX and an electric pulse erases the internet, getting rid of all of the troll history, which gets Gerald off of being a horrible person really easily. And can I just say, Gerald, the worst. His entire storyline, horrible. I hate it. It's so frustrating to watch. I mean, it's really well done and it gets to the psychosis of the troll and why the trolls suck, but it's so... I want it, I want him under the prison. <laughs> so yeah, the internet is erased, but now Carmen has been disillusioned with Heidi as he has leaned back into thinking that women are unfunny, manipulative snakes who just want to use men for their semen and their humor. Some people's dreams are other people's nightmares. Well, what do you mean? It was a joke. Okay, so season 21 is a lot less serialized, but it really brings everything together. So season 21, episode one. White people renovating houses. Since we last saw them, Cartman has continued to be distant towards Heidi. Rather than just being honest about how he feels, he frames Heidi just asking him what he's up to as a problem and responds with passive aggression. Oh, hey, babe, what's going on? What are you doing? Nothing. I'm just having fun with my friends. And they have a fight and he, of course, spirals down. Cartman has a new... I can't say it because I have one, but a A-L-E-X-A. -E and while playing with it, this exchange happens. I'm happy when I'm helping you. God, that's so cool. Alexa, define subservient. He then goes to school and tells his friends that Heidi is mentally abusive. Heidi abuses you? She does these things to slowly tear me down. Now... Part of why I've broken this whole thing down in an episode by episode breakdown is to show that we at no point see any of this. Heidi genuinely loves Cartman 
asks for honesty and Cartman, due to whatever brain worms he got from Butters, decides to be a complete dickhead and withdraw emotionally without actually ending the relationship, which he is clearly checked out of. Relationships are 50-50, Eric. We both have to make it work. We have to communicate to make sure that we respect each other's feelings. That's the only- Heady silence. He wants to be in this relationship, but he wants to do it his way, which is being an asshole. And when Heidi calls this out, she is treated like the problem. A relationship has to be 50-50, Eric. We both have to make it work. <laughs> now Cartman is telling his friends that she's mentally abusive because it allows him to control the narrative. This is Darvo in action. And it works perfectly for Cartman because in his own mind, he's not the one being unreasonable. He turns Heidi's concern into something that he would do, manipulation. Because now that the rose-tinted glasses are gone, the truth is he wants a servant, not a partner. Cartman breaks up with Heidi at school, presenting himself as the victim, and Heidi is forced into being the bad guy. Eric, I'm so confused. That's not going to work on me anymore. Love isn't supposed to hurt. Episode 2, Put It Down. This episode, which is also a Craig and Tweak episode, Craig and Tweak! Love them. Heidi and Cartman are back together, and Cartman tells his friends that he took her back because she was threatening to honor live herself. I broke up with her, and she called me being all like, I can't live without you. I'm scared what I'm going to do to myself. Oh, God. This is, of course, a lie, as Cartman is the one who begged Heidi to take him back. Heidi is worried about Cartman and tells Stan what happened, but the boys mock him for it. In usual circumstances, I would say this is cruel, but it's Cartman so he can go fuck himself. <laughs> you have to take me back. You have to. I'm going to Heidi. Cartman decides to make this his whole personality and becomes an advocate for suicide awareness. But of course, he doesn't care about other people, only himself. Voices stop so low, but every day I hear them grow, saying, Eric, don't do it, don't do it, now. Episode 4, Franchise Prequel. Not much screen time this episode, but we see a continuation of Cartman's gaslighting and emotional abuse. Heidi is treated passive-aggressively by Cartman, who gets angry when she asks for any of their plans to be fulfilled. I just, I thought we were meeting at the park. You didn't text or anything. Episode 6, Sons of a Witch. Cartman wants to go to the pumpkin patch, but is frustrated that Heidi isn't getting ready right away. Rather than explain what he's feeling, he just gets mad. She isn't ready fast enough. And again, doesn't just say what he wants in a non-passive aggressive way. Just twist the knife over and over. They don't arrive when he wants and therefore they miss out on the better pumpkins and other stuff. So Cartman reasonably decides to kill Heidi. Classic Cartman, he won't just break up with her because the point is ultimately that she is his to control. Death is the ultimate form of control. This is how we're going to get rid of Heidi. He dresses them up as Hansel and Gretel and then sets her up to be taken by the crack witch. Sadly, when he literally leaves her to die and they are reunited, her first ask is if he's okay. Come on out, little girl. Okay, just a second. She is saved, but of course the joke is that she's annoying. And I think right here at Son of a Witch frustrates me as well is that there is an underlined feeling in this episode that Heidi is annoying and therefore Cartman is right to be frustrated at her. Like her being late and the whole pumpkin badge stuff, obviously it's hyperbolic, but it's like, oh, she's such a fighty, you know, we're like, oh my gosh, she's a dumb girl. It's such a cliche that I, I genuinely don't really like this choice for their relationship breakdown because I feel like, I don't know, it just feels very manipulative. Episode seven, doubling down. This is a key episode in this saga. Heidi is getting calls from Eric, crying and apologizing for pushing her in front of a car and calling her a whore. Eric, you can't just keep being mean to me and blaming it on your blood sugar. He cries and whines and then the next day calls her a whore. That dirty whore! Who does that bitch think she is? Packing my lunch for me? Kyle is confused because he can clearly see Eric as a piece of shit, so why is Heidi with him? Kyle tries to talk to Heidi about it and we find out that everyone is telling Heidi that Cartman sucks. And even though she denies it, Heidi is very defensive about it because there is a lingering doubt she has about Cartman, but is trying to quell it. Look, don't you think I get it enough from my girlfriends? He sucks, Heidi. What's wrong with you? Cartman is trying to get around his own promise of being vegan and tells Heidi he found beyond 
KFC. They say you can even drink the Beyond Gravy by itself. It's like a protein boost. Yeah, it's really good. He then goes to school and tells all his friends that Heidi has put on some pounds and starts making fun of Heidi for what she's been eating, which is beyond Arby's. <laughs> Maybe you should uh, just waddle on down to the nurse's office. Stan and everyone else keeps telling Kyle it isn't any of their business, but he rightfully, in my opinion, pushes back. Going to the other girls, Kyle tries to get them to help, but they feel as if Kyle just likes Heidi and that's part of the issue. Oh my God, he so likes Heidi. Obvi. Deciding to talk to Heidi, she explains why she got with Cartman last season. Before we started going out, I was in a really bad place. Then this guy came along who told me all the things I wanted to hear. And I just went with it. Does that make me a bad person? Heidi starts to feel feelings for Kyle as unfaithful by Rihanna plays. Very good use of Rihanna. But it keeps avoiding me. She breaks out with Cartman and he goes around crying to Tolkien, whose name is now Tolkien. And he wants to go out and disrespect the flag. What time do you guys usually go out and disrespect the flag and stuff? He finds out that Kyle is with Heidi and flips out homaging great animated movies. A uh, great reference there. The girls take Heidi out and shame her about having dated Cartman, which makes her want to go back to him. Not out of love, but to prove that she wasn't stupid for having loved him. You make a mistake on your homework. What Heidi did was more like a momentary loss of all sanity. <laughs> <laughs> It allows Cartman to get his claws back into her. She breaks up with Kyle and gets back with Eric. And for some reason, it was decided that Heidi wouldn't just get back with Cartman, but that she would have absorbed his anti-Semitism as well. And my heritage is Irish, so I'm prone to being moody. And your heritage, well... It is this mirroring of Cartman that will highlight their relationship in the last three episodes. Episode 8, Moss Piglets. The girls are discussing Heidi and how mean and angry she has become since getting back with Cartman. She sews up and is breaking out, is chubbier and more irritable. Bullcrap, you're all talking about me again. Because you're judgmental bitches. Uh, she also forgets her obligations, like judging a special ed science fair, and tries to pull a Cartman to get out with it. She's kind of like Cartman, but with the ability to follow through. She has become the thing that Cartman always feared she would be, and it's all because of him. Episode 9, Super Hard PC-ness. Cartman and Heidi are fist fighting each other. Again. Oh, look a shot of Craig and Tweet. I love you, Craig and Tweet. They are toxic and everyone is relishing in it, except Kyle. Kyle is disturbed by Heidi's anti-Semitism and cruel behavior. Oh, Kyle's mom doesn't like the cartoon guys. Better shut it off. <laughs> 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 Baby, I fucking love you so much. Cartman, despite everything, is pleased with his chaotic Pygmalion and is loving her rage and violence when it's not directed at him. Episode 10, Splatty Tomato. The finale of season 21 has President Garrison as Pennywise for some reason. Ike goes after him to defend Canada and the kids all go to help Kyle find his brother. Heidi acts shitty and Kyle totally owns her because he is the voice of reason and thank God for that. I would never have the hots for the person you are now. As they walk, Heidi remembers the moments from her past with Cartman, throwing her phone off the bridge to stop being on Twitter. Aw, crack and tweak. <laughs> they go to the place where Cartman got his tech smash and Heidi keeps thinking about how nice he used to be to her. You used to be so nice to me. You used to be nice to me. I tried. But then you started rolling your eyes every time I tried to talk to you. Ugh. Then they go to the place where Cartman tried to get her killed by the crack witch. The ghost of past Heidi tries to reach out to her. Heidi grabs a gun and confronts Cartman about how he manipulated her into becoming this. I used to be kind. I used to be caring. But then you, you. She then admits to being in a victim mentality. She breaks up with Cartman for the last time and he threatens to unalive himself, but she walks away because she knows he's not going to do that. And that means he's no longer in control. After this episode, when we see her again, she's relatively returned to normal and not permanently marred by her experience with Cartman. And I haven't caught up with South Park, but from what I've seen, they haven't really addressed their relationship again. But these episodes were very intense part three analysis that was a lot of south park but the reason i wanted to get into it in an episode by episode way is because as i've done research about this topic the thing i've realized is that the details matter emotional abuse doesn't just happen overnight usually it is a slow rollout of actions as the abuser fully reveals themselves 
With Carmen and Heidi, it's important to see where they both were at the time they got together. Isolated from society, aka Twitter, Cartman had been scapegoated because it was assumed he was the troll, but Heidi herself left the internet voluntarily because her mother was a victim of online sexualized violence. Her reaching out to Cartman was a show of kindness, and I do think that at the beginning of their relationship, especially when she shows him her vagina, he does care about her and wants relationship to work. But look at how he talks about Heidi. You're threatened by her because she actually has interesting things to say and she's funnier than you. It's genius. You're not giving her credit for being hilarious. Do you think you could tell me some jokes? Why do you want me telling you jokes all the time? Because you're fucking hilarious. She's smart and funny. Funny is important because Cartman subconsciously does not think that women are funny. But saying that Heidi is makes her a cool girl, the ideal girlfriend. And at the very moment that Cartman thinks he could lose her, he lies. He manipulates. It's a subtle thing, but he's constantly telling Heidi that other guys don't think women are funny. And he never, like, tells us why she's funny. She's just kind of, like, hot humorous to her. You know, like, his idea of female comedy is Amy Schumer. So we know he's not playing with a full set of cards here. Oh my god, when Amy Schumer jokes about her vagina, I seriously lose my shit. <laughs> At SpaceX, when the idea is implanted that Heidi, and by extension all women, are just manipulative snakes, he goes with it because that is what he believes. He doesn't want to break up with Heidi because he likes the validation it gives him to have a girlfriend who supports and loves him. Just like all his other relationships, the fun is seeing how much he can push until they snap and then bring them back in, like a cat playing with a mouse. Yes, they could kill it, but that's not satisfying. That's not where the pleasure comes from. The entire season 21 is Cartman using Darvo on Heidi until she becomes reactively abusive. And while it's played on a certain level for laughs and the writers do seem to think mutual abuse is a thing, it is very clear that Cartman wanted to break Heidi and did so. Yeah, he's afraid of her when she gets violent, but having someone he can be racist and mean with is fun for him. He loves that she's cruel, just cruel to other people, because that means that she will not have any other friends and all she has is him. I think the episode Double Down is probably the best example of why it can be hard to discuss abusive dynamics with friends and family. Mocking someone questioning them about why they don't just leave and belittling the relationship is not going to help someone leave. No one wants to feel stupid. No one wants to feel their relationship was wasted, that their love was wrong. And when you're in the middle of it, everything is confusing. The love is still there. And before you have a chance to let it go, people are laughing at your genuine affection and trauma and feelings. And you don't feel loved by those people. You feel abandoned. I think it's extra pointed that the girls who are usually smarter doing this, other women can fall into this trap of feeling like they know exactly how they would be and act in a domestic violence situation or any kind of abusive dynamic to the point where they mock it and belittle someone who is in it because they think that they're so above it. It could never happen to them. They don't respect people like that. How it concludes with Heidi saying that she won't be the victim anymore it's something that I see speaks to the Gen X aspect of the creators and that despite the fact that we see Cartman being horrible and emotionally and physically damaging to Heidi, there is an idea that the show is saying that she has become just as bad. And in this, even though I think the creators are wrong, in their thesis, you can see the hard, uncomfortable truth of domestic violence emotional manipulation, and psychological gaslighting. It does not make you a good person. In fact, we need to start asking the question of why do we expect people who have been deeply harmed by narcissists to be good while they are in the thrall of said narcissists? The answer is because we want villains and heroes. We want the line between abuser and abuse victim to be as clear as it can be. And the fact is, unless you are an expert who knows the full context and have some idea of the people involved before they got into a relationship, you do not know. And the sad part is, even when there is clear evidence, as clear evidence as can be, people will still trust a more charismatic person unless they see the way that they like to see these things played out. 
which is in physical harm that leads to death. That is what people trust. But even but even so, if you go to Nicole Brown Simpson, there were definitely people who blamed her for her own death because why didn't she leave? Even though she did fucking leave. I lose respect for any woman to take a ass whooping when she don't have to. What people don't get is that the emphasis on physical harm makes it very hard for certain victims to come forward, especially male domestic violence victims, because there is a stigma that men cannot be abused by women. That is not the only way people are abused, especially that therapy speak has become appropriated. Just look at the way Cartman uses language from therapy to make his friends think he's a victim. But she needs help. I have to get her that help. Eric Cartman. A boy who we know fed dead parents to a boy over pubes. But that doesn't matter. Cartman is charismatic. He is able to manipulate people. He always has just enough clout to make his presence needed. Who's Heidi in comparison? She was barely a character before the storyline. Her friends don't even seem invested in protecting her, just making fun of her. In many ways, the most disappointing part of this storyline is despite it being the most perfect example of what reactionary abuse looks like, it will most likely come across to most as mutual abuse. But as the experts say, who has the power? Who injected abuse into their relationship? Who fed and controlled their girlfriend's food and then shamed their body? Cartman is the abuser. Cartman is the problem. Heidi even taking responsibility for her own actions is more than I think should have been expected of her. Just like in real life, it took Heidi multiple times to leave this toxic, abusive relationship. And if there is any lesson to take from this arc in South Park, it is that if you think your friend is in an abusive dynamic, protect them with kindness, not shame. Also, there is no such thing as a beyond KFC. And I am 10 billion percent sure there is no such thing as beyond Arby's. Nebula is the creator-owned platform that many creators, myself included, are a part of. I know I am biased because I'm friends with so many of these people, but the platform is filled with the fantastic insights and exclusive content of so many people that I not only adore, but respect. Some of the most recent are Broey Deschanel's series Taboo on Screen, Anita Sarkeesian, That Time When, Lindsay Ellis's Jurassic Park Turns 30, and Real Life Lore's Modern Conflicts, as well as exclusive content by Philosophy Tube, Jesse Gender, BKR, and many others. I have decided to finally throw my hat into the exclusive content series arena with Anime Court. After... Many delays, shrieks in legal things I cannot talk about. I'm so excited to finally be able to share with you this Yashahime video I've been working on for ages. I have been wanting a safe space to put all my anime content that isn't just video essays, but also just opinion driven stuff that had my usual nuanced approach to it without needing to worry about how it would mess up my main channel algorithm. I have learned this lesson before that it is not like me to experiment with different kinds of things. And Yashahime is an anime series that has stuck in my mind for a long time, despite it being terrible because of its mediocrity. And also, by the way, it totally ruined the Inuyasha fan base and started conversations it was not all equipped to deal with. If you are interested in seeing all of my Nebula exclusive content and those of the many creators on Nebula that you know and love, so go to nebula.tv slash princessweeks to get 40% off, just $30 a year, to watch my exclusive content as well as everyone else's exciting projects. It's a great deal and you also get to support all of your favorite creators on this platform. All right, enjoy your sneak peek and thank you for supporting my and other creators the Inuyasha fan base oh yeah and to get into that we really have to get into the issue with Inuyasha and the way it wrote women because Inuyasha has a female co-lead and is written by a woman I think that it often gets passes from fans about the way it wrote its female characters some of these issues were compounded by the anime which loved to take the worst qualities of Kagome and Kikyo and crank them up by like 10,000 percent but let's look at the main women that we have in the series there's Kagome, Kikyo, Songo, and Kagura I'm not gonna include Kana or Rin or Kaede because they're not really a part of the major series. Let's start with Kagura, my personal nemesis. She's an incarnation of the main villain, Naraku. I always wanna say Naruto. Naraku. <laughs> she desires to kill Naraku and be free of him someday and allies herself with Shishomaru in order to do that. They have a whole like sexual tension kind of vibe thing. If you're into that, I know people ship it. That's not for me, but respect. Kikyo, my favorite character, 
uh, Basashi Shamaru, <laughs> was a priestess who was in love with Inuyasha and was manipulated along with Inuyasha by Naraku to killing each other. She was resurrected later on and is kind of an anti-heroine for the rest of the series. She's also, you know, Kagome's descendant spiritually. But when she was alive, she wanted to be a normal girl and felt burdened by the role that she had as a Miko to protect the Shikon Jewel Shard. These are two female characters who are the most morally gray deal with issues of autonomy and long for something more outside of their own existences that have been predefined by them. And they both die. Meanwhile, you have Sango and Kagome. Sango is established at the beginning of the series to be like this master demon slayer. She is the sole survivor of her village and is generally a badass aesthetically. But what does she really do as a character? Beyond her relationships to Moroku and her brother Kohaku, she doesn't really do much. She's really just there for attachment to other people. She's often turned into a damsel in order to help Moroku have character development, which is frustrating because Moroku is a bad character. And Sango just kind of gets put into the back burner a lot of the times. And unfortunately, because of the way of like a lot of shonen series, the main cast of Inuyasha are functionally useless past their introduction unless they are actually Inuyasha or Kagome because those are the ones who get the power levels, they're the ones who get the most development, their relationship is the core of the series and everyone else is kind of like there. Now Kagome. Kagome, Kagome, Kagome! <laughs> Kagome is an interesting character who I don't like and to be fair it's because the fandom would not let me like two women so I chose, and I chose the one with bangs. Technically they both have bangs, but I chose, I, cho I choose the Hime cut every time. Kagome is 15 and she's thrown into this massive adventure with like a hot half dog man with no shoes and she's sprung. I get it, I understand it, I respect it. She tries to balance her life in the normal world, in the past. And you know, that's that's kind of the core of it. Like the will they won't they between Iyasha and Kagome is exhausting, brings out the worst in them because we already know what's gonna happen. No one watches this show and thinking you're gonna end up with Kikiyo. <laughs> so you're just watching the, the these characters go this back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And while Kagome does go through character development and character growth, I don't wanna take that away from her. She definitely like levels up so much throughout the series. Ultimately, none of that fully matters because her end game is just to be with Inuyasha. Everything else peripheral. I don't think they ever really do a really good job of exploring how the stakes connect to the future, but that's another problem. Essentially, you have the only two women, adult women, in air quotes because they're teenagers, who survived the series and exist in both the manga and the show because Ayane, I love you, but you 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 was you was at you were you were immigrant. You were you're an immigrant to the show. Our wives, mothers, who essentially fold their lives into their partners. Yashahime introduced Sango as Moroku's wife. A sin I wish that's what I knew. That was the first that was the first flag. Despite the abundance of female presence, the series is very traditional and even more so in the anime. I would even argue that one of the biggest mistakes of the series is having Kugome go stay with Inuyama. Inuyasha should have brought his ass to the present day and been a house, been an indoor dog husband because why she gotta be over there? Especially since Kayane can apparently live for like 25,000 years. I mean, God bless. I guess the healthcare is really spitting up there. That doesn't say they aren't cool or dynamic or interesting or, or just worth enjoying like I, I still love looking at Sango aesthetically I think aesthetically a lot of them are very cool but at the end of it all their importance ends up being tied to men so when you're gonna make a Babies Ever After spinoff with a character who has no love interest or any clear romantic desire to have kids because he's a fan favorite but we're gonna do it anyway uh you don't have any women who exist and are alive established who can serve that function you do realize you have Rin have you picked their names Toa and Setsuna. Yeah.